How are you right. doing? It is such a pleasure to see you, JP. You too. And this is all pretty fresh. <laughs> see what good. happens when a little bit of time goes by? Yeah. Oh, a little bit of Sean Connery there. <laughs> no, I, 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 Kirsten likes it, so I get to, I guess, you know, I'll wear it, you know. <clears throat> no, that's I, good. I, I wanted to quickly say, uh, just in case there's anyone who hasn't had the great fortune of meeting you, that this is... Uh, JP Fournier. J JP is a fight instructor, a fight director, a fight master, and the matron at arms with Fight Directors Canada. And uh, also, of course, you started FDC. And uh, we're really, really, really lucky to have you. And I'm su super happy that you joined me. And is there anything you wanted to add before I start peppering you with questions and getting you to uh, tell us some wonderful stories? Oh, that that's, sounds good. Um... I, I suppose we should have done this before, but I'm curious where all this is going. Well, here's my goal. My goal is pretty simple. I feel not just because of COVID, but just generally the rush, rush of today's life that we fall out of um, touch with people. And I want to make this, uh, this is called Fight the Good Fight. And this is a chance for artists to talk about what they love in their work and their life and, and basically making connections. And I've been able to talk to um, different people like Todd and I've talked to uh, Nathania and Jackie and and so I wanted to add you to the list because I can't think of anyone who has more to add than you <laughs> and and if I may because this is a good you set me up perfectly um, what I'd love to talk to you about is the experience you've had with change I think a lot of people today are, are rightly really concerned about the future of art, let alone stage combat. And you've had the wonderful opportunity of, of basically growing throughout your entire life and your experiences within the arts. And it gives you, you, you have the opportunity to see change as it happens, right? And I think it's going to be useful for you to put things in perspective. Like this is a wild time, obviously with COVID. At the same time, I bet every time you had Based a major change, it felt like a wild time. <laughs> well, we've had a few over the years. Sure. So, and things have really changed over the years since since I began. So when I began, <clears throat> um, the theater, just getting into the theater, was a strange and um, it was it was kind of a bizarre. Uh, people in the theater were were known to be odd and strange and theater was not my parents uh, my father in particular never wanted me to get into the theater professionally because it wasn't a job it was a hobby and i was advised by my uh, high school guidance counselor to just throw away the idea because it was a hobby and that it was a fantasy you know right. you can't you can't make an you can't make a living in that so get real, get, get realistic. And I said, no, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting because I think a term that comes to mind for me often is there seemed to be a, a change from really gifted amateur to, to professional when we look at how fight direction changed. Well, over the years, it's really, really changed. When, when it began, uh, there were no fight directors. There was actually, well, there was Patty Crane in Stratford. And, um, and actually before him, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, I'm so bad with names. The old actor, um, and he, Ben Campbell, Ben Campbell's dad, um, was the first actual fight director in the Stratford Festival. So before Patty arrived, um, God, what was his name? That's that's age. So my no, name. No. I no, see no, his no. face as big as No, because otherwise I've been having senior moments since I was like oh. born. You know, I'm terrible. I've been at having them since I was eighteen. So, but then just before we leave this, let me ask you: How did how did this gentleman before Patty? Uh, come to fighting like was he a fencer was he he know? he came from uh, first of all he came from uh, england and uh, he was brought over by guthrie 
partly for his acting experience, but partly because he could do the battle scenes in Richard III, which was their first show. So if you ever see the Stratford archives, uh, there's a, uh, some wonderful scenes of his battles and they're pretty good. And so he was actually our first fine director in Canada. And following him was Patty Crane, who spent about 25 years at the festival as an actor and fight director. Um, so that was a big change. And out west, in where we were, there was nobody. So I took fencing because I, I was fascinated in my early days as a, as a child with Robin Hood, the Richard Green Robin Hood series. And Patty actually worked with him as well, Patty Crane. Wow. And um, so there's a, a long connection there, you know. And anyway, um, I studied fencing with um, a guy in Winnipeg, Juan Gomez Perales, who was in 1950 was a saber champion. And right after him, when I came back to the U of A here in Edmonton, I studied with a guy named Fran Wedderberg. And Fran Wedderberg was the premier fencer in Canada for seven years running. He was uh, the Epe Saber and Foil Champion across the country in three national competitions a year for seven years running. No one beat him. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. And uh, so he's in the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame down in Red Deer. <laughs> if you had asked him, do you think he would have picked one of those weapons as his favorite? I'm just curious. People ask me this all the time, right? What's your favorite? And His favorite was Epe. Mm. And his next favorite was Sabre. Right. But he taught us in our class because he thought we were enthusiastic. Um, and we were or some of us were. So he taught us a handful of things that would be fun to do on stage. And they were fun. I still do them today. And he also taught me some fencing moves. He said, when you meet a left-hander, they're always used to meeting right-handers, but the right-handers aren't used to meeting left-handers. So you do this. And he gave me a little trick. When I went to England in 78 to study with the Society of British Fight Directors, and we, we used to go fencing at the Polytech Center in, uh, in London every Thursday night. And I fenced with the leading Epe guy in England. And I was an, you know, I was an intermediate fencer. I wasn't, certainly wasn't advanced, but I used uh, Fran's little trick. And I got the guy three times before he got me once. Wow. And wow. then he stopped and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just trying to uh, get some hits here. <laughs> and he said, okay. He said, I think I've, I think I've got it. And so we carried on and, and I got him once more. So I had four out of five hits. And then he got me, <clears throat> excuse me, four in a row, just bang, 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 like that. Because he figured out what I was doing. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Just, just so I don't forget, for people interested in the Robin Hood you were talking about, the, the Richard Green Robin Hood, yeah. uh, I saw his episodes are actually on uh, Amazon Prime for people who want to indulge in some <laughs> lovely old style, uh, um, was it 1950s or 1960s? 50s. 1950s um, yeah. TV. Uh, and... And he had, uh, he had an effect on me, too. I, I remember watching him, and, and, and I just was in love with, with the, the quality of that show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and he did, uh, with Patty, they did the, uh, Patty actually played the, the Sheriff of Nottingham in the, uh, the Sword of Sherwood Forest, ah. which is a, a film, full-length film, with Richard Green in color. Fantastic. So it's kind of fun. And before that, uh, Patty also in color did uh, The Master of Ballantrae with Errol Flynn. And Patty did the first left hand, right hand uh, stage fight in that show because the, the actor playing uh, the other part opposite Errol Flynn in that was a lefty. Ah. So Patty went left to help him out and Patty doubled for him. And he also doubled for Errol Flynn. So. <laughs> 
he flipped back and forth. Remarkable. Remarkable. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that was really interesting stuff too. So if we stay with that period of time in and meaning that you're studying with Patty and you're, you're at the beginning uh, of your career, sorry, uh, meaning that you're in the UK, let me correct that. Uh, is there something that really leaps to mind that you've noticed a major change in, in either how all of us or how you approach uh, stage combat that just wasn't uh, the norm then? Well, the norm then, just so people understand, the norm then was all based, really based strongly in saber fencing and a bit of foil. Um, <clears throat> and then it was, we used to, you know, we used to loosely call it hack and slash. Mm. And um, every, every fight with every weapon was essentially the same. Today, over the years, people gradually, largely due to people like uh, Brad Waller and people like him, got more historically interested in the actual moves that people did in history. So uh, Capo Ferro became, finally people found out about him. And there's a guy in um, Robert uh, Sharon in, in the States who studied uh, uh, Fieri, or is it Fieri? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it's Fieri. And uh, studied him in detail, went and learned Italian, learned the classical Italian, and then he learned modern Italian. And then he took the books and went through them page by page with the knowledge of already of uh, Capo Ferro and uh, a lot of the grappling techniques of those periods. Mm. And he went through the book from top to bottom. It took him 10 years and he wrote the English version of it. So it's fabulous. But what, what, it, what you finally discover is that that style of fighting is very similar to the Eastern martial arts. So the Japanese and the Chinese had already done those, or, or we knew that that had been in their, in their lifestyles already. And now we found out that it was actually in Europe as well. Right. But we so didn't know that. I, so I he, that all a kind of faded off and disappeared. Right. Uh, and that's what Hollywood became yeah. Hollywood. And a guy named Ralph Faulkner, who lived till he was 95, and did his last fin or stage fighting lesson about two months before he passed away, did all those early fights in the, um, in the films that we know. And, and then there was the, um, uh, what's his name, uh, from Belgium. <clears throat> I can't remember. Uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, I should have made a list. Oh, you didn't know all the questions I was going <clears> to <throat> ask, you know? But I, I think, I think you anyway, touched on so, something that's really important, though, that, that there's something about uh, memory that's been continuous, as you said, that we've been able to see in the East uh, among Japanese and Chinese practitioners. And there was a break in the West that we had to, uh, dare I borrow the, the that we needed a renaissance to return uh, the learning of these systems. And, and Brad Waller and... Um, and um, the other gentleman, sorry, uh, you just said. Robert Chern. Right. Really, really helped uh, bring it to, to attention. And now we have lots of people, like Todd Campbell, for instance, um, taking it, making it their own within communities of people that approach. So I, I, I love yeah. that we're seeing that happen. It's fabulous. You know, and there's lots. And, and people are talking more in within Fight Directors Canada as well, are talking more about expanding the scope of that learning and in, to include not just the, the Western, what we term the Western martial arts, but the Eastern martial arts and martial arts around the world, around the globe, because now we can do that. So, uh, for example, through uh, Lord of the Rings, there was all kinds of, you know, down under mm -hmm. styles of fighting. Some they created, yeah, Tony Wolf. But, yep. but some they, they actually took or um, took off the Aboriginal 
societies down there, when they saw them grappling and wrestling, it was a different technique. And so they took that and injected that into the movie as well. So Carrie Teal, mm -hmm. who is our, our own Canadian girl, yep. spent four years on Lord of the Rings and has since become an international, uh, she's a wonder girl, you know, with mocap and all that. Absolutely. Um, but what they did is they expanded the style of working so that we're not just doing the kinds of fights that we saw, that you and I saw in those, um, those 1950s, 60s, early movies, but it expanded and it started to change and they added more things in and uh, rapier and dagger came into play, which before then had been, you hold a dagger and then you fight with the sword and every once in a while you do something with the dagger just to make it look like you were doing something. Until we found out there was an actual huge uh, vocabulary of work that we could use and inject into the theater and people like Todd, when I went to Stratford in, um, in when, when the FDC, when you guys were, um, and I went to the, uh, a rehearsal that what Todd was doing, he had the fighters in Zestrazzi doing Spanish and Italian, right? which was so interesting. Yeah. I, I love that. It was a great, it was a great show. And, and I love yeah. what uh, Todd did. Yeah. yeah. You know, I got to see that and I got to see it in process, which I think was for me was more interesting. And I'm, you know, and I think it's really good that we, uh, as, as a group, uh, fight directors and all that we, that we do expand the scope of that work and that learning, but it's also good to remember the things that we came up through that give us a solid base sure. and when you teach and this this is something that we're all facing today when we teach we teach what we know well what we don't know we let others teach mm. and so it's i think it's important to continue teaching what you know but be open at the same time to those things that are coming in or can come in and broaden the scope of our learning and what the audience eventually sees, you know. So gives everybody an expanded scope on a novel idea, what the arts are supposed to do. And, <clears throat> you know, right now, <clears throat> while COVID is, uh, has stopped everything for a while, it will come back it'll be a little different, but I think it'll come back full blow when, <clears throat> excuse me, when they found a vaccine yeah. and when things are in control <clears throat> and audiences can return to the theater and people can work together again. So I think it's all gonna come back, but now is a good time to start considering all those possibilities and slowly move get ready to move and add in some of those changes not but i don't think we should drop what we've learned right in other words don't drop what we those basic things that we've learned in the past and skip them just to go into the future i think we need to hang on to both that's mm -hmm. so 